Hello. Hi, Kelly. How are you? <laughs> Good morning. I'm great. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you and to everyone here watching. Uh, um, how, how did it go? How was it New Year's? It was great. It was very low key, but it was it was good. But sometimes low key is good, <laughs> especially yeah. this chaotic time of the year, right? Yes. I, I I took a different route this year too. I usually like I always do something on New Year's Eve, go out and you know all that stressful stuff. And this year I decided to like actually host a party the day before New Year's Eve, and I took a very chill this year, stayed with my pups. <laughs> <laughs> and just enjoy the evening while the fireworks are going. Happy New Year to my fiance. That was it. <laughs> yep. Did you do yep. anything with the kids? We played games. Um, it was kind of like game night. My son's girlfriend came over. She was over for a couple hours, and uh, her parents were. I I said to, I said when she comes over, she's gonna need a ride home because we will be drinking. So without <laughs> leaving, we're not gonna drive her home after having a couple drinks. But so she she came and played some games, and just kind of low key chill. Bring in the 2023. <laughs> Getting ready for it because this this year is going to be an exciting year. There's a lot coming, so yes, I'm very excited. So just to do a quick recap, then last time we we kind of skipped a week because of the holidays. Um, so, but the last time we talked we talked to our special guest Leslie from uh, the title company Finch Art Abstract, and uh, we went all over um, title and what the costs were, what title about, what it's for. Uh, so that's kind of like the topic of the last episode. Um, and then today we're going to be talking about five ways to make your offer more competitive whenever you are on a bidding situation, right? Whenever you're going for a house and it just happens to have already other offers on the table and now you have to make your offer more appealing to that seller. So that's going to be the topic of the day. Um, but first, as usual, we're going to do the myth of the day. <laughs> So it is really tied in into our today's subject. So a lot of people think that when you are competing, you want to make your offer higher and they think higher is better. But that's not true, right, Kelly? There's a lot that goes, not necessarily entirely true. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. And uh, we're going to try to break it down to you guys and let you know five ways uh, of how actually make your offer better. Because higher offer is not necessarily a better offer, but a higher offer with good terms is going to be a better offer. Sometimes better terms is better than a higher offer. And uh, we're going to break it down and people are going to understand that a little better. Alrighty, so let's get right into it. So five ways to make a competitive offer. And the first one we just talked, um, it's offering a little bit higher. Um, and also you could make a higher deposit money. Um, as we spoke about when we did the episode about the steps of buying a home, we explained that once your offer is accepted, there's something called the earnest money deposit that you have to put it down. And then sometimes whenever you're in a competing situation, um, the buyer has the option to make a higher deposit uh, to show that seller they really want the house, they're committed to purchasing it, and they put more skin in the game, right? You can make a bigger deposit down because that's what they're willing to lose if something goes wrong, but it just shows the seller that they really want the house. Uh, so that's one way to make it more appealing. Um, and also an offering higher, but there's a lot that comes with the offering higher that people don't realize. Um, Maybe you can mention to us on the lending perspective, um, things that come tied in with the offering higher that a lot of buyers don't realize, especially with that type of financing they may have. Well, first off, with putting any offer in, having an actual pre-approval in your hand with the higher offer and proof that you have that higher earnest money deposit is really key. Yeah. Um, so with the pre-approval, um, doing the higher offer, obviously you want to check with me, the lender, to make sure that you're you're okay with doing the higher offer. You're still pre-approved at that because they want to see that. And But with the higher offer, you are going to also have 
higher transfer tax. Um, so there's just a, there's a lot of things that go into play with it that you want to make sure so that the seller knows that you are a solid buyer. Um, you know, obviously the higher EMD, we, I, me as, as a lender would verify that you have that money, you know, on hand. Um, we collect all that stuff up front so that our pre-approval that you give to the seller is valid um, because they want, you don't want, you don't want it to fall apart, you know, halfway through or at the end because really they weren't pre-approved at that. It's just what they thought they could make. So always check with your lender to make sure that you can be pre-approved at that higher amount because there's all a right. lot of things that go into play. And that's a lot. The numbers are going to change for sure. Your monthly payments going to change, especially now that the interest rates are slightly higher. Mm -hmm. uh, the higher the amount, it actually does impact a little bit of your monthly payment. So you want to watch out for that. Um, now, on the other hand, we can talk about the fact that um, there's different ways to approach offering higher uh, that maybe some people may not be aware of. Uh, one of them, we were just chatting, you brought it up, was just using an escalation at the end. Um, so you don't necessarily just can have to offer a higher amount and go to the top of your limit right out the bat. Um, on the bidding situation, when you have multiple buyers uh, putting offers, the seller is not going to have the opportunity to go back and forth with all of the buyers. So what they ask is that you send your best and final. Uh, but a lot of the buyers don't want to just offer $30,000, $40,000 over right out the bat, even if they're willing to go there. Uh, so that's why we use what's called the escalation addendum. Yes. And that basically allows that buyer to offer up to whatever they're comfortable offering in increments set by the buyer. And th that escalation then is only going to kick in when there's a competing offer that surpasses their offer amount. So could you give us maybe an example just so they kind of like can understand the numbers and how that could have potentially escalate? I'm sorry, say it again. Do you think you can give us like an example of how that can escalate, how that would apply the escalation of the engine? So I, the way I would do it is I would look at what they and what they are comfortable with being pre-approved at as far as having that higher, like how, how high do they want to go? Yeah. What is their comfort level? So say we have a $200,000 house, but we know there's, um, several buyers coming in at it, you know, I would take the numbers, maybe bump it up to 30 purchase price, you know, look at their down payment, see what payment they're comfortable with. If they're comfortable with bumping it up, you know, the, doing the escalation cause to 230, um, then that gives them like a $30,000 range um, in that escalation. And I would make sure they're pre-approved at that before I would say, okay, yes, do you know, make your escalation this, um, and go over all the payments and, and all that with the, um, with the different scenarios that way they can see, you know, where it would be at. And I can update a pre-approval in 15 minutes. Like, it's, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, usually in this scenario, we would request you to just send the pre-approval at their maximum at the highest. Amount. Yeah. Yep. That way we know exactly what worst case scenario would be at. Um, but to, to say, let's say the houses, like you said, is listed at 200 and the buyer tells me, hey, I'm willing to go up to 230. I ran the numbers with Sally. I'm comfortable with the totals up to that amount. Uh, so how the escalation would kick in, since we are not able to go back and forth with that seller, um, the, if the competing offer, let's say the highest competing offer is 215 and on the escalation addendum we created for our buyer, it says they are willing to go up to 230, but... Um, it is going to be increments of a thousand. So if the highest competing offer is 215, then our buyer is going to be that offer by a thousand at 216 and then win the bidding, right? Yeah. So that's how it would go. But, and that's a big but, um, just because you have the higher offer doesn't mean you're going to win the bidding. It's not an automatic decision like that because, again, going back to the myth, higher doesn't necessarily mean better. The terms of your offer can really be crucial for you to win in that bidding. Uh, and uh, maybe the other terms for another buyer with a lower offer can be a much better and much more appealing to the seller than yours that is higher. Um, so that's why we're gonna kind of break it down. So just to go very clear on this one, 
you can offer higher as part of being competitive, but that's not all you can do to be competitive. Correct. Um, because, and, on, and on the lending yes. side, I would make sure, you know, if the seller, I would make sure that the seller, I would make sure you know as a buying agent and the seller's agents, welcome to call me too. Um, I would make sure they know that it's a solid offer. I've already verified. They have the money. They have the pre-approval. If the appraisal doesn't come in at that higher offer, they still are in good standing. So that's the whole key point with making sure that you're good on the lending side with offering that higher amount. Correct. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a big thing because the appraisal doesn't always come in at that. And we always have to take as a lender, we take the lower of the two, the lower of either the purchase price or the appraised value. Correct. Now, now that you brought the appraisal, that brings us to number two then. So a lot of people don't realize this when they are buying a home, right? They, they think, okay, oh my gosh, I'm going to offer 230. That means I have to pay the difference of the, between the appraisal and the offer amount. And that's not always true. Because when you, let's say you're a first time home buyer and you're using an FHA loan, um, you are you have to have what's called an appraisal contingency in place. It's built in into your law. You, you can't really get rid of that. Um, which means that if, if, let's say you did offer two thirty on that two hundred thousand dollar home, right? Going back to the example, um, and then now the property only appraised at two fifteen, but you are under contract at two thirty. You do not have to pay the difference of fifteen thousand because you have an appraisal contingency. A contingency protects the buyer. So that's why I said offering higher doesn't necessarily mean it's better because it's not guaranteeing the seller that amount that you're offering if you have an appraisal contingency. So that brings us down to option number two of how to make your offer more competitive. Um, if you are buying cash, of course, there's no financing. Whatever you offer, that's what it is. So yeah. that's a very different story. If you offer higher, then it is better because there's no contingencies in place. But right. on financing terms, which majority of people are financing, you would have to either offer what's called an appraisal gap or waive the appraisal contingency altogether. Now, to explain the difference between the two, uh, an appraisal gap would be you determining a specific amount you are willing to pay in case there is a gap between the appraised amount and the amount that you offer the seller. So going back to the example, you are under contract at 230 and the appraisal came back at 215, but you originally offered the seller as part of your offer that you were willing to give a $5,000 appraisal gap. So now the property appraised at 215, your final purchase price would be 220 mm -hmm. and then you don't have to pay the additional 10 because you specify your appraisal gap amount. So that's a way of you controlling right uh how much more you're paying on the house but it's still making it appealing to the seller because you are ensuring the seller that regardless of what the house appraises they're getting five thousand more right if it, right. you know if your appraise is below what you're offered um now the no appraisal the waiving the appraisal contingency that would be if you have really good amount of money right you have comfortable money and then Kelly would have to actually kind of back you up on this on the financial <laughs> side and uh, give that le the seller's agent confirmation. So maybe you can explain that portion a little bit better and also talk about the appraisal waiver. In that case. Yes. So um, with I'll start with the appraisal waiver first. So with yeah. an appraisal waiver, it is possible. Um, if you're looking, you would have to be putting 20 percent down on the property. And it all depends on, we do an automated underwriting um, on our loans, which pretty much gives us what is contingent on the pre-approval. If you are putting 20% down on a property and I have all of your information in my system and I run it through, there's a very good possibility that you would get an appraisal waiver, which means no appraisal. Um, and that is... Um, that gives you some more buying power for sure. and, um, yeah. because we could close your loan in two weeks if, with no appraisal. Um, yeah. And I think one thing to point out on that specific point there. So with an appraisal waiver from Cali, 
you do not have to worry about paying any gap or any additional amount because if the bank is okay waiving it so whatever happens there's no appraisal so you're just giving the seller whatever you offer no matter what right you're just for sure going to be with your monthly payments based on the offer amount you offered yes yes and if i knew the algorithm i would tell you <clears throat> because some properties get it some don't i don't want to say it depends on the age i've had older properties get an appraisal waiver i've had newer properties not get a waiver yes. so it, that's true it's like the area the house the I mean, and part of the borrower too, um, you know, if you're, if you're a vanilla borrower, most likely it's going to happen, but not necessarily, not necessarily, but it's definitely buying power with getting that appraisal waiver. Um, and I think that was, was that it? Did, was there something yeah, else you wanted that, to that was for the appraisal waiver. Now let's say the bank is still offering, I mean, still making it uh, that you have to have an appraisal, but now that buyer wants to waive the appraisal contingency, um, then you would have to kind of just prove to that leasing agent that, that a buyer has enough money in the bank account, right? So yes. that would be a different scenario. So Correct. So appraisal would still happen. In that case, um, you know, obviously the seller is going to want to know if, if they have the money for that contingency. Yeah. So if the borrower, cho cor correct, that's what you're asking me. To yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's where I come into play and I would make sure, you know, I would verify, you know, pull their statements to make sure they have enough cash in the bank, must be in the bank um, for that appraisal contingency. So, you know, if the seller calls and they're like, you know, what if the appraisal doesn't come in? Are they in good standing? I would verify that. I would make sure they have that money and it's enough to cover, you know, the appraisal contingency that's in the sales contract. So yeah. that is something that we would do. We, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have you do an appraisal contingency for somebody if they didn't have the money yeah. to do it. Correct. Now the only big, big, big con on this this option, which it is like you're still doing an appraisal, but you waiving the contingency of the appraisal that that buyer will have to pay the difference between what's under contract by like the sale price and what actually appraises. So we don't know what that's going to be because we don't know who the appraiser is, how much is going to appraise that. We have an idea, uh, but we never know because in every appraiser is different. So if you're under contract at 230 and that appraisal comes in at 200, guess what? That buyer is going to have to come up with a $30,000 gap because they waive the contingency altogether. Correct. And, and that's that contingency though, but if you remove it, then you do. And that's again, something I would verify. So yeah. if it gets removed and you know, we're stuck at that and you know, whatever the appraisal comes in at, I would have to make sure they have the money to do that. Correct. So, um, yeah. yes. We're, the lender piece is very important when it comes to all that. It really is. And and this is, would all be done before we even place the offer. So this would be like, okay, we're trying to be competitive. What can we do? And then that buyer says, I have the money. I don't mind. I want this house. Now we would make sure that you do have the funds. And then she would formulate a pre-approval that states that, yes, we are doing an appraisal, but this buyer has enough funds to fulfill whatever gap is needed. Um, so that would be not necessarily something I personally recommend uh, because I feel like it's better to provide an appraisal gap and control what that amount is going to look like, right? Because nobody wants to be what we call it upside down on your loan because you're paying too much more than the house is worth. So, you know, we don't want to be in that situation. But if someone really wants a house, sometimes they are willing to do whatever it takes. Uh, yeah. It was not recommended. Um, it is an option. So I just want to make sure we're providing you with all the options that are available out there. That has happened before. Um, so that's the difference between appraisal gap, appraisal waiver, and no appraisal contingency. So those are the three different ways we can do it there. Okay, so moving on to number three then. Uh, that would be waiving the inspection contingency. So... This one is a tricky one, right? Because um, we never want to tell the buyer to waive uh, an inspection on the home. And I want to 
clarify that we were talking about the buyer's home inspection um, because under the appraisal process, there is an inspection that the appraiser is going to do of their own. Um, so that's separate. If we're talking about the buyer inspection. Um, and then the buyer has the option to choose to do home inspection or not. It's not mandated by the financing side unless there's a couple exceptions. It's like a VA loan uh, or maybe under the PHFA program, they have uh, termite uh, request and then the VA loan requests and also termite tests. And if there's a well on the property, we have to do a water test. Um, so aside of those exceptions, a buyer's home inspection is not required, um, but it's definitely recommended to uh, every buyer to do an inspection. So you yes. learn about the house you're buying, know what's wrong or not with the house you know even for you to learn about the house and how to properly maintain it because the inspectors they're not there just to look at what's working or not if you go there and attend it which i always recommend to do so they will explain to you how the house works you know how you should be maintaining when you're living in the home where is the water main or how to change the filter you know they are going to go over all those little things which are so important so when you are in a competing situation Unfortunately, the first thing the buyers do is waive the inspection and then forces all the other buyers that want to try to be competitive to do the same thing. Uh, what that means is that when you're waiving the inspection contingency, uh, the buyer is waiving their ability to negotiate possible repairs with that seller. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my buyers don't know that a, buy a home buyer's home inspection is not a pass or fail. It's not something that if, it, if something comes up wrong, the seller is going to have to fix it. It's, it does not work like that. I wish, but that's not how it works. Um, it is just an ability uh, for them to negotiate those repairs with the seller. So when you waive that contingency, you're just take, uh, removing that you know ability of, to negotiate with the seller. That's really what you're waiving. But you can still keep the right to inspect a home just so you can get to know the house and know what you expect. Um, but you can waive the contingency. That way the seller knows you're buying the house no matter what, right? You're buying the house no matter what comes out of that inspection. But you can still do the inspection to learn about the house if you want to. Um, and that's what that means. So it gives that seller kind of like a clear peace of mind that, you know, no matter what happens during the inspection period, that buyer is going to go through the financing process or if it's cash, going to go through the cash process and buy the house. Um, so do you know, do I have anything to add to this, Kelly, you think? I don't think so. I think you pretty much covered that. Um, you didn't say anything that I wouldn't have said. It's definitely recommended to have the inspection, but if you choose not to, um, then, I mean, that's your choice. It's, you know, that definitely helps. It's one less thing that the sellers have to worry about if, you know, if something little, even if something little comes up that needs to be done to the property prior to settlement. Um, but yeah, you honestly, you didn't say anything that I wouldn't have said. Yeah. And, and, and even though this uh, waiving inspection, it's a little bit scary, right? Because the buyers are like, what if the house is falling apart? Or what if there's a structural foundation issue? Um, so those things could be potentially found during the appraiser inspection. Unless you're waiving the, you know, the appraisal, then you, you have no contingencies, but could potentially. It's just that a home buyer inspection, it's a lot more detailed than yeah. an appraisal inspection. The appraiser yeah. is just there. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and the other thing that they could do is they could get a home warranty, which mm -hmm. would cover um, certain things that would could poss that would possibly go wrong with the house within a certain period of time. Yeah. So if you're going to waive your inspection, we do recommend getting a warranty yes. on the property. And you are able to get, so home warranty is how they work. Um, they're usually valid for the first year. You are able to extend to a second year if you want. Um, you pay them up front and you can actually you pay it at settlements when you buy a home. Um, and then you will cover all the major parts of the home. And there's many different things you can add to your home warranty to make it more extensive, right? You cover more items. If you have a pool, you can add a pool additional add-on. Um, so there's different things you can do. But our home warranty is definitely, I think for any purchase, even if you have a home inspection, because I've, 
you know, th there's always something that's up. It was working and then it breaks as soon as you start using the house. Like, so a home warranty is just kind of like a kind of peace of mind that you know you can have. And the, the, the deductibles of a home warranty are usually pretty minimal. They're between like 75 to 125. They're very, very low. Um, and that's all you have to pay. And if the HVAC just goes to, you know, goes to town and decides to stop working, um, that's six to $12,000 potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're paying a hundred bucks to repair. So it's, it's definitely worth it regardless of whether you yep. have inspection done or not. I, I always like use my house as an example because when we moved into our house, we had, it was, everything was at its life. We had to get a new heating and air conditioning. We had to get uh, a new hot water heater. Uh, we had to get a something else. Oh, our septic, when the house was built, the septic was put in wrong. Oh, wow. And we had to have our septic fun. replaced the first year we were living there. Um, so, That's a big deal. But, oh, and then our house was also struck by lightning. So, I mean, oh my gosh, I don't think a home warranty would have covered that, but a, yes. a warrant something would have covered. That, that 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 would be the home homeowners insurance. <laughs> so that's that's maybe since we're talking, right? That's a big thing that people get confused. A home warranty is an optional warranty uh, that you're getting to kind of cover you on the major items of the house, no matter what happened or why it happened. A home warranty covers, right? Right. A homeowner's insurance is like a car insurance. It would so cover you if your house got struck by lightning. <laughs> yeah, if it's struck by lightning, a homeowner's, a homeowner's insurance would probably cover that. But you have to file a claim, just like you, if you had a car accident, you have to file the claim for it. So it's a little different. They have to do some research. They have to do their reports. Um, but a home warranty, even if you broke it, it still covers it because it's a, it's a warranty. So it's yeah. covered under the warranty. Yeah. And it's definitely, I, I love that you brought it up because that's that's a, a, a really good one. Uh, anybody buying a house, I feel like it's, it's usually like around the $500 range. Uh, maybe if you add more stuff, it might be a little more, but so worth it. I mean, yeah. it's so worth it. Anything breaks, even in like, the, those heat pumps uh, units, they're usually pretty dated, uh, you know, majority of the homes, unless you're buying a newer home. So those are the first ones to go, usually, uh, especially when you buy on the winter and then, um, I mean, on the, on the summer, and then you need to use it on winter. That's when they stop working. <laughs> so yep. Yep. we don't know if they were working properly or not. So definitely, definitely recommend it. So yeah, so that's that's one of the options uh, that we have to make your offer competitive is waiting to continue to see on inspection. This is scary. Yes, it is. Um, don't recommend it. But if you are in a competing situation, that's normally one of the for sure things that people are going to be waiving uh, to give that seller the peace of mind that the is going to go through. Um, but I do recommend to counter that getting a home warranty for sure. So moving on to option number four. Um, and then just to, to clarify to these five ways to make your offer competitive. They don't have to be all at once. It can be one or another, or if they can, you can actually do all of them if you want to, <laughs> if you really like, oh my gosh, I want this house. Um, but it's just like, there's different things you can do to make the terms of your offer better instead of just offering higher. So the fourth one is the paying for the seller's transfer tax. When Kelly and I had the episode about the closing costs, we explained that one of the costs the buyer incurs is a transfer tax, which is in our area here is one percent of the purchase price. So whatever the purchase price, price purchase price is, you have one percent of transfer tax, um, and the seller also has to pay one percent. So the one thing that buyers can do, because a lot of people say, "Oh, I'll, I'll pay for the seller's closing costs." Not necessarily, you're not paying for all their closing costs, but you can offer to pay the transfer tax. That's the one thing that you can offer to pay on the seller's behalf. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't sure if Kelly had something to add on to. No, just, and again, on my side, I would just make sure they had enough cash recovery. to do that. I yeah. mean, my side on a lot of this is just making sure they have the money to do it. Yeah. So that's all in your pre-approval. Yeah. Pre-approval is key. <laughs> yeah. And going back again, we do this all before we put the offer. We will yes. really work as a team, me and you and, and Kelly, to run the numbers and ensure that no matter what offer comes to it, like the price, the terms, 
that you are fully qualified, that we know exactly what you're going to need financially, to, you know, to go for that type of offer. Um, and then if you do have the funds to offer to pay the transfer tax, which of course would increase your closing costs, um, then we'll, we'll make sure that that's one of the options. Sometimes this option is more viable for people that may be waiving the inspection contingency. They might want to keep the inspections, but they are willing to give the seller more money upfront, um, you know, to kind of balance not waiving the inspection. So yeah, um, this is a popular one. Pay the transfer yeah. tax became very popular within the last two years when we had very very strong sellers i mean we're still in the seller's market technically but the last few years were just crazy uh strong with seller's market so um that's that was definitely a very popular one i don't think i i wrote any offer that did not offer seller's insurance for tax i feel like every offer had that included so very very popular one and it's an easy one because then you know for sure how much you're paying extra on your closing costs um, on that property. So it's just 1%, you know, so people liked that controllability of how good your offer can be and how much your costs would be. Um, and then the final but not least, um, it's paying for the buyer's agent commission. Uh, we did explain this uh, in Pennsylvania and in the other states, the, the buyers do not pay for agents commissions. Like we right. work as a buyer's agent, I don't charge the buyer anything. Um, they don't have to pay for commissions. So that's paid for by the seller. But on a bidding situation where you're trying to make your offer more competitive, you can uh, say, hey, uh, Mr. Seller, I will pay for my buyer's agent commissions. Or you can say, I'll pay a specific amount towards my buyer's agent commission that will kind of look to the seller as a credit. Um, so customarily, it is between two and a half to three percent that the seller may be offering to pay the buyer's agent. Um, so the the buyer can pay cover the whole amount, or they can hover cover just a specific amount. They can say, "Look, I'll put a thousand dollars towards my buyer's agent commission, or I'll pay the, the entirety of the buyer's agent commission." So that's an option because that's not customarily done by the buyer. So it looks more appealing to the seller when offer, the buyer offers to do that. And we did see that quite a bit, right, Kelly? I think it was yes. a lot of my buyers. Well, yes, a lot of yours were, they were paying the commission, yeah. which um, I, of course, would let our processing know that as well. Because when we do that final... Um, the final closing disclosure that is that does appear on there, which I didn't think it did, but it does. Yes, so, it does. Um, credit of some sort. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. So that it that was definitely a popular one. Um, them paying the the buyer's commission. Yeah. Yeah. So those were the five ways to make your offer more competitive. Um, if anybody have questions um, about any of them, because I know specifically when it comes to the appraisal and the escalation of the ending, a lot of people get very confused <laughs> on how yes. they work, what's what's my numbers are going to look like. Um, but please just, you know, reach out to me and Kelly. We can definitely break it down. I think the, the easiest way sometimes is just to pick a house as an example and run the numbers uh, to show you what that would look like. And we will, we will do that for for sure, you know, when you're ready to put an offer on the house, we make sure that we run the numbers together with you. Um, yep. and really make sure you understand what the worst case scenario would be in case all those things apply uh, or in case you want to offer all those things and uh, whether you're going to do a specific amount for like the appraisal gap or specific amount for the buyer's aging commission. Uh, we will run the numbers based on that and then let you know, okay, this is going to be your total you know, closing costs needed at settlement, and this will be your potential monthly um, payments. That way you feel very comfortable in that no matter what, you know exactly what's, what you expect financially um, before you purchase that home. So it's not like a gasting game, uh, just offering whatever without knowing what's going to happen. So we, we do take this very seriously and we run the numbers up front to not only make sure you're comfortable, but also to prove to the seller's agent and sellers that you are financially viable for what you're offering to do. Yep. All righty. Yeah. You have anything else to add, Kelly? I don't. No? I don't. I think it's all about just, you know, making sure that you talk to us and you understand 
how it works. You know, that's why we do these podcasts to show you that you understand, yeah. you know, what you can and can't do. But so I, I really, I really don't. I think we awesome. covered things pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think of anything else, um, reach out to us. We have our information scrolling to the bottom. Uh, this will be recorded so you can always watch back um, and go back to, you know, the beginning, each topic to, to see if you maybe understand later on. But yeah, just reach out if you have any questions at all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly, for staying here with me today. I know it's New Year's Day. We're starting, it is. We're starting the new year fresh with new episodes. <laughs> <laughs> more to come <laughs> more to come All yes right. awesome thank you so much you guys for watching you guys have a great day happy new year to everyone yep, yep. happy um, new year everybody see you guys bye bye bye